Probably one of the most basic things when it comes to our physiology is sweat. But do we fully understand the mechanism as to why we lose fluid during training competition, why we end up with a pool of it below our trainers indoor, and why we have to open our jerseys to get the airflow going and help manage what's going on internally? That's what we're going to talk about in this video today. So I'm going to quickly finish out this trainer set and let's talk about everything to do with sweat and how the body regulates temperature in a process called thermoregulation. So let's jump into it. Welcome back to the channel, Nick here, making sports science simple. And in this one, we're talking about the process of how we regulate our body temperature, particularly as things start to heat up. This is known as thermoregulation. And as athletes, it's almost inevitable that we are at some point in time during our training, racing and competition, that we are gonna sweat. Athletes sweat, sweat baby. And realistically, this is just our body's defense mechanism against overheating. At the end of the day, body likes homeostasis. And homeostasis is a fancy way of saying, what is the optimal functional range for all of our physiological processes? We like to stay within very narrow bandwidth to make sure everything can process and work as best as possible. All the little enzyme activity, breaking down fuel, creating energy, all of those little things need to work within this very fine band to get maximum out of them, not just in training and competition, but also just everyday life as well. Now, the process of maintaining that temperature is what we call thermoregulation. It's our body's mechanism of increasing sometimes or even decreasing our body temperature to remain within that homeostasis range. That range typically for most people has a core body temperature, so that internal temperature within is about 36 and a half to 37 and a half degrees Celsius. If we get too hot, things are gonna to start to shut down. And if we get too cold, things are also gonna to start to shut down. That is a process of ensuring our survival. Again, we wanna stay within that range so that our body can continue to function as optimally as we need to be able to complete and perform whatever we need it to do. So we're always constantly adjusting that temperature to make sure our internal physiological processes can function at their best. But when it comes to heating up, before we get into things like sweating and how we cool ourselves down, we need to understand, well, where does the heat come from in the first place? The obvious intuitive answer is, well, it's gonna come from our environment, hot day, that's gonna cause us to heat up, isn't it? And you're absolutely right. Radiation from the sun, the infrared waves coming off, that is gonna cause us to heat up. And yes, the environment is gonna play a bit of a role. Hot environment, you are gonna naturally heat up. Cool environment as well, you know, naturally cool down a little bit. So that's gonna have an impact on that range internally. The other thing that often gets overlooked is actually within our body, we are constantly producing our own heat, particularly as we start to exercise. Now, this is part of the process when we're breaking down fuels and creating energy. When we transfer from one type of energy to another, so in the process of exercise, let's say we go out for a run, we're breaking down things like carbohydrates as a fuel source, chemical energy, so to speak, in terms of what that starts out as, and we're trying to translate that into what we call mechanical energy. So me actually swinging the arms, pumping the legs, and getting running that transfer of energy from one type to another is always gonna result in some form of loss uh, somewhere. We're not gonna get 100% of the carbohydrates into my system, break it down, digest it, and 100% is gonna be translated into energy. There's gonna be a loss there, and largely that loss is represented as heat. And that's where our body internally is gonna produce some of its own. So where that ends up being is things like muscle temperature. You'll notice that as you start to exercise, body starts to feel a little bit warmer. That has a positive effect. Warm-ups are okay and warm-ups are great. We need a little bit of that increased temperature to get ourselves going. That little increase is gonna uh, increase our ability to perform, not only produce force um, and our overall, our ability to produce power as a result, but it's also gonna decrease things like muscle tension. So we're gonna have a little bit better range of motion. There's a little bit of an injury preventative side to that by having a bit better range of motion so we're not all stiff and sore all the time. So all those things are great. So a little increase in temperature like that is fine. Once we extend that out over a longer period of time and couple that with that environmental aspect, that's where we can get into trouble with our homeostasis range of that 36 and a half to 37 and a half degrees because we might start to exceed that if we don't have a mechanism in place to be able to prevent that from just constantly increasing, increasing and increasing. And that's where our thermoregulation processes come in. Our body's ability to adjust and ultimately internal climate control. Hang on, we're getting a bit too warm. Let's just bring it back to that normal range we like, or we're getting a bit too cold, let's bring it up. But in this circumstance, we're largely talking about, well, what happens when we heat things up? And so once we've produced a little bit of that internal heat, or ultimately we've gained it from the environment as well, bit of both, we need to start worrying about, well, how are we gonna cool ourselves down? And the first process and the most common process you're gonna think of is sweating. 
we start to see our body produces this fluid that comes out, runs down your arms, runs down your face. It's gonna help cool ourselves down. And it's really an inevitable part of the training process, particularly for most endurance athletes. Now the sweating process, in really simple terms, where is that fluid coming from and what is it doing? That fluid is running around us all the time within the blood. Majority of it, if not half of it, is blood plasma. That is predominantly made up of water. That is cycling through the system. And that is a really effective way in terms of transporting heat from the core, so internal, where we are starting to feel the effects of warming up and where we don't want that heat to increase too much. It's a really easy mechanism to transfer that out to the extremities of the body because we've got this fluid that is quite conducive to absorbing some of that heat. So internal, the blood absorbs some of that heat, it's gonna take it out to the extremities and away from the core. So where does that go? Well, the surface of the skin. So before you start to sweat, what you'll probably notice as an initial process is you'll start to see the skin go a bit red, whether that's in your face, your arms, your legs, you start to notice that redness. And all that is is blood being redistributed up towards the surface of the skin to try and allow us to radiate some of that heat off. So radiation's a little bit of that heat process almost reverse to what we're getting from the environment. The sun radiates heat towards us, well we can radiate heat back out to the environment as well. And that's by largely trying to get the heat towards the outside of the body and the surface of the skin as best we can. Now as a follow up to that process, now we've got the blood towards the surface of the skin, well where does that fluid that we know as sweat come from? Well, we're gonna lose some of that blood plasma through our sweat glands out to the outside of our body and that's gonna take the heat with it. Now this isn't the end of the process here, this is just the beginning of the sweating side of things. The secondary part of that, the actual heat loss part, is when that fluid evaporates. Now evaporation is just the transition of a fluid or a liquid into a gas. That is just the sweat on our arm disappearing and magic, when I say magically disappearing into the atmosphere, that is gonna take the heat with it. And so a really, uh, I guess, easy way to think of this is when you're sweating and you're in a cool environment, if you ever looked at someone and seen the steam come off them, and this, this sort of, uh, I guess, gas floating around them when it's really, really cold, particularly when it's dark and you put a light on someone, that is the evaporation process happening right in front of you. You can actually then see that gas as a nature of what the temperature side of things is doing or the temperature difference. Ultimately as well, even if that doesn't transition into a gas, the sweat will come off us. And if that just drops onto the ground, well, again, it's taking the heat with it. I don't really care at that point where it's going, but largely that will evaporate into the atmosphere as a gas. Sometimes, if we're in a different medium, something like water, that's just gonna disappear into the water. And ultimately that's a different process, not quite evaporation, but I'll get to a couple of different ways we cool ourselves down in a moment as well. So as long as we are rehydrating ourselves, getting the fluid back in, we're gonna be able to keep sweating and really keep effectively cooling ourselves down and maintaining that nice homeostasis body temperature of that 36 and a half to about 37 and a half degrees, as we mentioned before. I'm not gonna get too much into, well, what happens if we stop sweating and what happens about dehydration. I'm gonna save that for a future video, but a couple of other points I wanna touch on in terms of other mechanisms going on are some of the other ways we can also cool ourselves down. Now, one of those is radiation. As I said before, blood flow comes up to the surface of the skin. We are gonna release some heat by radiating it away or transferring it away from the body in that manner. But then we also have something like conduction, our ability to be able to take on cooler temperature uh, and exchange that for the hot temperature. So this is done through surface interaction. Really simple one is maybe during a race, you pick up a cup of ice at an aid station and you just hold onto it in your hands or you put it in your cap, put it down the back of your shirt. What that surface interaction does is the ice is obviously quite cold. Our temperature internally is quite warm. What are they gonna do? Well, they're gonna just try and switch. We're gonna put the heat into the ice, so it's gonna cause that to melt, but that cool temperature of the ice is gonna be transferred into us via the skin, into the bloodstream. We're gonna circulate that cooler temperature back around and have a bit of an exchange like that. So conduction's a, a manner that we can use, but it's not always that practical and it might not be that effective during exercise because you'd have to, in theory, be constantly holding on to something quite cold, which if you've got an ice vest, you might be able to do but in most circumstances, it's not gonna be the one that's gonna give us the greatest uh, ability to maintain our body temperature when we're on the go and we're running around, cycling, training, doing whatever we need to do. A final method we can use is what's called convection. Now convection is the transfer of heat from effectively our body into the immediate air or fluid around us. So a really simple one to think about here is if you're really hot, end of a race, you might jump into something like an ice bath uh, where there's nice cold water, you might just jump into the water in the ocean. That mechanism really is taking heat away from us into the immediate uh, fluid around us, so the water around us, and then that water's gonna dissipate elsewhere. So that's sort of similar to what we're doing when we're doing this evaporation process and our sweating process, but it's going through a slightly different pathway 
again, it's not as effective. It's only as effective as the temperature around us. So as long as that water is colder than your internal core body temperature, this will work really effectively to cool you down. If your core body temperature is the same as the water, it's probably not gonna to work too well. And if the water temperature is actually higher, that's where it's also not gonna to work too well um, in terms of trying to cool us down. So ultimately we're a bit reliant on the immediate environment. Another way that this does occur, you'll probably notice it mainly when you are running outdoors or on the bike outdoors, is the airflow rushing past you. Cool air is gonna come from external, again, reliant on that cool air around you being cooler than your core body temperature. But that air coming past you is gonna rush past you, take on some of that heat in that immediate layer around you, and then move it on. And you'll notice this quite a bit on the bike, and a lot of athletes report when, like triathletes in particular, on the bike they notice that they might not sweat as much as what they do on the run, and that's because there's just more airflow. You're moving through that a lot faster, and it's gonna rush past you a lot faster, so that exchange might happen a little bit quicker, a little bit more effectively. These methods, not quite as effective as our sweating. Our sweating's gonna be our primary and most effective during training and activity and exercise, but these are also at play as well to be able to maintain that homeostasis and really start that process of cooling ourselves down. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an insight in terms of how we regulate body temperature when things start to warm up, background of sweating and what the mechanism is there and, and how we actually go about sweating, what the process is, and then some other ways we can cool ourselves down as well. This is gonna be a bit of a beginning point for a little series about how we regulate our body temperature because it's a really, really critical one. In the Southern Hemisphere here, we're heading into winter soon, so we're more concerned about warming up, but I understand a lot of the viewers on this channel who are in the Northern Hemisphere, maybe in Europe or the US, you guys are heading into summer, so it's really important to worry about cooling yourselves down. We've just come out of that, and I know a lot of athletes over the summer who really struggled as temperatures got up, they really struggled with that process of cooling themselves down. So hopefully if you can understand the base principles of how we regulate body temperature within the body, how we produce heat, reduce it, all of these various things, it's gonna go a long way to be able to improve not only your training, but ultimately your performance in racing as well. So hopefully you got a lot out of this one. Looking forward to this little mini series on the channel about regulation of body temperature. That's gonna be it for today and we'll see you in the next one.